Let's see, I'm going to call the meeting to order, and we'll do the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so we'll move into our uh, work session and receive an update, hold a discussion, and give staff direction regarding proposed economic development policies. Ms. Philpott. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming here today to do a little bit of work on um, our economic development policies for the city. I am the Economic Development Director for the City and the President and CEO of the Nacogdoches Economic Development Corporation. Um, before we de delve into our specific policies today, I just kind of wanted to do a little bit about um, what is economic development, do a little bit of a workshop. Some of this, I apologize, will be a bit of a repetition for those of you <laughs> that are familiar, um, but it's always good to touch on things and, and to just remind ourselves. Um, at its core, economic development's goal is to achieve the items on the screen. It's important to balance these things and realize that if any one of those things is out of balance, um, the others can be negatively affected. For example, if our employers don't offer a competitive wage, um, then our workers can't, don't have a, a high quality of, of life. However, um, if wages are artificially escalated too high, then our companies will struggle to grow. And so it's important to look at this list and make sure that we balance in all things on that list. And you'll see that kind of, balance is kind of a theme throughout our, our discussion today. And please stop me at any time with any questions. There we go. Um, and another way of thinking of economic development is as, is as an ecosystem. Um, it's balanced between the physical and financial development, which is seen there as economic development, um, the policies and infrastructure from our local government that support that physical and financial development, and then quality of life represented by clean air, living wages, quality schools, quality health care, entertainment, etc. If we develop too fast, you impede the quality of life. So we've all seen those bedroom communities of Austin and Dallas and Fort Worth that just exploded in growth and they're scrambling to build cities or to build schools and, and water lines and subdivisions. Um, then again, if we develop too slow, we lose quality of life because we don't have the tax base to support those things that we need. So um, also if we lack proper policies, that can also affect our quality of life. Um, kind of similarly, if we grow too fast, we, we don't protect the things that we love. When people think of economic development, probably 99% of the time they think of that bottom right box there, um, recruitment. They think recruiting target, recruiting that next big industry. Um, and I know you know um, in a rural community like Nacogdoches, it's actually one of the smallest pieces of what we do. Really, um, economic development is split into community development on the left and business development on the right. So community development is ensuring we have all the pieces to make our community good for supporting, develop, supporting the economy, supporting business, um, making sure that we can support and expand and recruit business. Moving over to the right-hand side there, the business development side, um, it is important to realize that most new jobs are created by small business. So out of every 100 new jobs created in the private sector, 55 will be created by the expansion of local business. And so that's why so many of those things you see on the right-hand side there really are affiliated with local business because they're the bread and butter of our economy. I was just speaking to some exchange students um, that are here from SFA, and I talked about the fact that they, they're from Tunisia. <laughs> and they were, I asked them where they had eaten. Um, in Nacogdoches and they just got out of quarantine and one of them had eaten at Whataburger because she knew that was a Texas icon and one had eaten at Butcher Boys and we explained the differences between the two and how it's so important to support those national chains that bring that national recognizable presence but it's also important to support the Butcher Boys who are a local family they support our t-ball teams <laughs> they they are a family that's been here for generations and how we've got to be able to support both of them in order to grow our economy 
currently and in the near term future, NEDCO's focus will be and has been primarily on workforce development. We're working a little bit with SFA on this, on their Center for Rural Innovation, and I know that's also something that the council has mentioned is a priority for you, and so that will be something we will work on in the near future. Physical infrastructure, if I see you and I don't bring up I-69, I need one of you to yell at me and say, Larissa, talk about I-69. Um, it's incredibly important to us. Broadband, um, we're currently undertaking a broadband access study. Investment in city utilities, expansion of the airport, which we will also cover a little bit later today. Policies, um, City Manager Canizares and the city staff in conjunction with NEDCO has really um, dove into the issue of reviewing our development policies, our comprehensive plan, our vision for the future. That's all tied into economic development. Um, entrepreneurialism. You'll hear more about that when I give my annual report in a few weeks. I did see Scott Boyer, who is um, one of our NEDCO officers. Um, he's, he's integral to our entrepreneurial program at NEDCO, but that's a big part of what we do. And then also retention and expansion, and that's just constant, regular visits with our local business owners um, and our local plant managers. It's really problem solving, and sometimes it's giving them a hug. <laughs> sometimes it's trying to fill a gap for them. Sometimes it's, it's decoding city speak for them to try to fix a problem, um, but it's just being in contact with them on a regular basis. And then the last piece there is recruitment. We can't discount that even though it's, it's not most of what we do. It is incredibly important. Um, and just as a reminder, our current targeted industries are aviation, which is great. We've got a project on the agenda tonight for that. Healthcare, which we know is incredibly important to us right now, and we will be looking at how we can support our healthcare industries with COVID funding in the future. Advanced manufacturing and IT. Um, another piece of this puzzle here um, is um, the social infrastructure piece, and and I would be remiss if I didn't mention that, that we are blessed to have an engaged set of elected and appointed officials. You all I know are very interested in economic development and that is not always the case in every community um, and it helps tremendously to have that support. So economic policies um, tend to be somewhat vague <laughs> because they do need to be agile. Um, they need to be able to respond quickly because we have not thought of every potential business that we need to use these for. And if we had, we would have started that business ourselves, right? <laughs> if we could have invented the iPhone, we would have. Um, and so what we talk about is um, how do these policies, our economic policies specifically, um, how do they address the needs of the community? They need to somewhat mirror the best practices found around the state. We're not going to reinvent the wheel. We're not starting from scratch. We're using things that other communities in Texas have utilized. We need to remember, though, Austin's economic development policy and Lufkin's economic development policy don't work here. They have different tools at their disposal than we do, so we have to somewhat specialize that. We do need the document to be specific enough so I can use it as a marketing tool so that I can go to an aviation-related company or a healthcare-related company and say, this community wants you here. We specifically described your business in this policy. We want you here. Um, but then again, it needs to be agile enough so that somebody who has the next great idea tomorrow that we never could have dreamed of so that it could be addressed by this. Um, our policies have to be realistic. If we only incentivize the biggest of the projects, we're never going to use it. And then again, if we incentivize everything that comes in our doors, it's going to dilute what we have. And then also we need to, they need to reflect our goals as a community. Um, that's something you might have seen if you looked at the current policy in our packet. Um, it was vague and did the job, gets the job done, allows us flexibility, but doesn't really tell you much about Nacogdoches and doesn't tell you what we need and want in the future of our community. There's two policies before you tonight. The Chapter 380 program, which is an, the incentive program you may already be familiar with. Um, the cities use these programs for years. Prior to that, um, the city utilized tax abatements and developer um, extent, utility extension policies, which accomplish the same thing. It's just a different name. <laughs> this is a little bit more detailed in its policy. Um, the other policy is an economic development fund, 
This is an entirely new policy, and it will outline the uses for the city's economic development fund. Um, it'll protect the fund so that it's only used for economic development, um, as the city manager said, so that future councils and future city managers don't raid that fund for something other than economic development. So the objectives of the 380 program are very similar to just the general objectives of economic development. Um, this specificity, however, is not in our current document. It doesn't talk about contributing to the support of neighborhoods um, or a, um, stimulation of innovation. Those are things that we felt like showed a little bit more about what Nacogdoches is. Um, there are some program examples in there. This is not an inclusive list. However, it, it is a list to show potential projects, like I was saying, if I can go to a business owner and say, look, we've described your project in this policy. This shows that we want you here. I think that means a lot to businesses. So the eligible projects, again, these are not all inclusive, but just meant to give a general idea of what is permitted. Um, generally, expenditures for physical improvements, job training, um, infrastructure assistance, and also quality of life projects. So each application is reviewed on its own merits. Um, we don't only look at the direct benefit, but we also look at the indirect benefit to the community. NEDCO um, paid for a study a few years ago that shows for every thousand students that are brought to, new students that are brought to the SFA campus, the community receives a $16.6 .6 million indirect economic benefit. Um, there is also an indirect benefit of just more activity at SFA. It, it's hard to put a dollar on some of the, the benefits that a company may have. Um, this section additionally is another place for the city council to um, show what is important to us here locally. If you would like to add anything to this list, we certainly would, would love to hear that. Um, these are things just based on comments um, recently from the council that we've added in there. And like I said, if you'd like to add anything, we can do that. This is your policy. This is just like an ordinance. Adopting this policy tonight does not mean that it's written in stone forever. If you want to come back and amend it, we certainly can do that later. So we've explained what types of projects we want to incentivize, um, and now we need to determine how, how we do that. These lists of incentives um, are long established as appropriate incentives across the state. Um, this is, there's nothing really groundbreaking here, to be honest. These are very common. Um, Nacogdoches has utilized all of these incentives at one point in the past. Typically, our most common incentives are going to be reimbursement for infrastructure, so a city water or sewer line that the project needs that's not in our current CIP to build very quickly. Um, the developer will put in that water and sewer line, the city would reimburse them for that water and sewer line, and then later another company or a residence or whatever nearby can use that same water or sewer line. Um, also cash bonus for capital improvements. So let's say that the city capital improvements program has always slated a two inch water line along a certain street and this development needs a four or a six or they need a larger line. We can, can incentivize installation of that larger line to service that project. Bonus for job creation is something that you'll see in cities that do have a large economic development fund, um, which we currently don't have, unfortunately, but it's just nice to have it in there so that we could utilize it in the future. You'll often see, for example, in the city of Lufkin, they'll incentivize um, a new company that's coming $2,500 in a cash grant for every job that they provide. Tax abatements are super common and super simple. The way we do them in 380 agreements is a rebate. So the project would pay their taxes on, on the new valuation that's added. We never want to dip into what has already been paid to the city in previous years. We always want to work off of that new value. Um, and then if they perform in the way that they said they would in the agreement, the city would rebate that new value back to them. And so that's kind of a win-win. We know that that value will still be there at the t when the agreement is over, let's say 5, 10, 15 years, um, but we've not gone back below that initial value that the project started at. So the criteria for each industry um, 
it varies for each industry. Um, you can see for those on the, on this list, we're looking at just a minimum of a $1 million valuation or 10 full-time equivalent jobs. For retail or commercial, they're going to want a little bit higher valuation um, and then limit that also to infrastructure reimbursement. Try to, to think about what a um, retail or a commercial development would most likely need. Um, and then also think about the fact that a retail or commercial development is probably adding to our quality of life, but not adding much to, say, our workforce. The employment's probably going to be fairly low-paying jobs, pretty low-skilled jobs. Um, so we don't really want to incentivize the creation of those jobs. We just want to incentivize the creation of that project here. And then small business. This one is new. This is not covered in our current agreement. These are going to be very small um, agreements very for very small businesses which make up most of our economy. So when I say small, that's just a number. It, has, it do, does not mean that they're unimportant. Um, the point of this is to help those small businesses kind of get over that hump, to maybe buy that new piece of equipment that pushes them into a new phase of their growth, um, to increase safety of their existing structure. Let's say somebody wants to change the occupancy of a structure. You want to move your restaurant from one building to another, and it requires some fire safety improvements. Those can be expensive, and so this grant would, would help with that. Nothing in these policies um, would prevent council from considering any type of incentive in any type of um, project. I think that's important to note. I keep saying that, that we don't know what the next greatest thing is, so we want to make sure that you have the flexibility to review that when it comes. New to this policy also is a timeline and a process. Um, developers like processes to know, bankers like processes to know when the revenue is going to start coming in. Um, if you know me, I, you know I like policies, and, or I like processes and checklists. Um, and this policy also includes an additional level of review. Traditionally, the way it went was we got a pol we had an application, staff would review it, present it to the city manager, we would negotiate, and then it would go to city council. Well, this is adding in that Economic Investment Review Committee, which is a committee of um, NEDCO officers and NEDCO exec committee members um, who are bankers and attorneys and uh, small business owners themselves to, to utilize their vast expertise as a different level. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm looking at this review process. And Correct me if I'm wrong, but um, there are reviews that are 30 days, 45 days, 90 days, and then the city council has 10 days? That is based on an agenda deadline. Know that I traditionally will come to you with, and I don't have them formally in here, and we can certainly add that to the policy. I will come to you in an executive session at various points along the way to tell you I have a project, are you interested in incentivizing this project? And that would probably be between the initial review and the economic um, review committee. And then we would probably have another one of those discussion in executive session. The city council, that 10-day council consideration is just the final, here's our agreement, everyone's ready to sign it, are you, com are you ready to sign? Does that make sense? It, it does, but I would appreciate more sure. of that built into the policy. Okay. And also details as it goes, not just here's where we are, but economic details. Yes. Earlier on. I will amend it to give more time for council at that point to review. Um, and then I will also put in the um, various um, executive session meetings where I'm able to come in and give you those specific okay, details. I'll you. insert those in the timeline. General, but I do sure. want to make sure that we have a little more time. Absolutely. And they're in the process. They're just not formally documented there. So we'll make sure we, we document okay. those, certainly. Yes, sir. Is this our standard on the process, or is there industry standard as far as day one to day 100? It is... I took that timeline from another community and actually shortened it. <laughs> so we're actually moving a little faster um, than some communities. Also, um, keep in mind that we may have to extend that if it's just the largest one we've ever done in the world um, or if it's a very, very small one, we could shorten it. Yeah. So I'd, I don't think any project developers would be offended by that timeline. Um, 
but we could also move faster or slower if the project needed it to. This is just kind of a, a planning guarantee for them to keep to, for the because project. Because my question was going to be, do we need to uh, react sooner in some of those time frames in between day one and day one? We certainly can. Um, what I like to think of this is this as um, our deadline, and if we can move faster than that, I think that's great for all involved. If we need to move slower than that, we can do that too, um, but we need to be transparent and upfront with the project if that's the case. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Just some caveats again, we do this on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, we do a cost-benefit analysis always. Um, you are never obligated for any project. So just because we went through that whole process, this whole process, and, and the commission or the, the council felt comfortable throughout the process, and then at the last minute you didn't, you're not obligated. We are, we are only obligated at the time that the agreement is signed. Um, so that's something, a little bit of pressure to uh, alleviate off of yourselves. Um, and then also we can support projects pretty much anywhere we want to. We can, we've had that discussion a little bit about how our hands are tied with annexation. And there might be a project right outside the city limits that we can't annex, but we get a sewer line there, we get a water line there. And even though they wouldn't be paying tax dollars, they may be employing a lot of people that would come and work, or would come and buy homes in Nacogdoches and buy you know sales tax items in Nacogdoches. So we can't apply this outside of the city limits. We just need to be judicious in that cost benefit analysis to make sure that it really is a true return on investment. Any other questions about that policy mm -hmm. or concerns? But, and I, I just want to make a statement. Any county benefit is a benefit to Nacogdoches, would you like to think? Absolutely, absolutely. And we're very lucky that we have a great relationship with our county um, and that we can have a lot of these economic <coughs> development discussions kind of on a joint level that, that we, can, we can certainly support projects throughout the county. I'm going to move on to the Economic Development Fund. Um, this fund was created in 2017. I believe Commissioner Bolden was here, or Council Member Bolden was here um, in 2017 when it was created, and the point of it was to emulate a 4A, 4B sales tax. We don't have that here in Nacogdoches. We know that. We know that the city of Nacogdoches gets one cent of our local sales tax. The hospital district gets the other cent of the local sales tax. Um, that is a vital tool in many cities to economic development. So the admi city's administration in 2017 dis was determined to come up with a way to somewhat emulate that. And the idea behind that is if we are competing with another city and all things are equal and the other city is able to offer some sort of incentive that has a large price tag and Nacogdoches is not, we're going to lose a large portion of the time. Um, and so this is just kind of a way to piece by piece save what we can in order to support those economic incentives. Um, this fund currently contains a little over a million dollars. The policy... I just want about the million and sixty-eight. Mm -hmm. Are we funding that enough? I mean, that's been four years ago. And we only have one point. That is a dangerous six. question to ask your economic <laughs> developer. Um, I believe we are. Um, that's that's $150,000 a year. Yes, okay. that's, that's what this policy calls for. Up until this point, um, we, had, we didn't have an incredible need for the projects that would be funded out of this. Mm -hmm. I say that with a caveat. I have seen economic activity uptick very strongly. We are seeing developments that are interested in not just the I-35 and 20 and I-10 corridors, but they are interested in East Texas. And so as of today, yes, I feel very comfortable with that 150000 Could I use more? Absolutely. But we have a limited pool to work from, and so I, I am very grateful for what we have, and we certainly can utilize what we have. I was just asking a question. We wasn't going to give you <laughs> <laughs> Yes, ma'am. So the million dollars came from the general fund, or where did this million dollars come from? It is split between the utility fund and the general, the utility funds and the general fund. 
And sanitation, I apologize, I forgot that one. It's split between? Sanitation fund, utility, utility funds, funds, and general fund. General fund. Okay. And the 150000 per year would be split the same way, is that correct? Yes, yes, Going it would be. Forward? Yes, be split 50000 out of each one of those funds. Am I good? Okay. <laughs> um, so the fund would be utilized to fund incentives in the 380 program that I just described. Um, it could also be used to, play, to pay for plans and studies that tie to economic development, like a retail leakage study, workforce development studies, fiscal analysis, um, things like that. The fund could also be used to pay for entrepreneurship or workforce training. These are typically things that, that a 4A, 4B fund would, would normally pay for with sales tax. The policy does not allow the fund to essentially pay for things that um, are ongoing, ongoing assessments, um, like the city's annual NEDCO contribution. Um, this, the fund would not be used to pay for utility extensions or repairs that are already in the budget or already planned. Um, so, for example, um, Mr. Bartlett's Bonita Creek sewer line project, um, <laughs> we would not pay for out of this fund because that's just an ongoing expense that the city needs, a repair the city needs to make. The policy would not be used to pay for the reimbursement of taxes in an agreement. So, for example, when I was talking about the tax rebates that we could issue, um, the point of it is to not to backfill with those. Um, there's no need to backfill, really, because that's just a wash. It's taxes that are paid and then rebated back. The fund really should only be used to pay for the things listed listed on here. Now, is that both 4A and 4B? Not exactly. Um, 4A, 4B is a longer, a much longer list of things, and so we really limited this to end. 4A, 4B projects can be very expensive. <laughs> um, and so this list of things that this fund would pay for are generally things that we expect would come up in the course of an economic development discussion. But a 4A, 4B would funds the complete economic development process in, in those communities, doesn't it? I mean, there's no other monies put into it except for that sales tax. Correct, correct. In, in our community, we are essentially paying for the operation of NEDCO through the city, the county, and our gracious private members, um, and then also paying for economic incentives through this economic development savings account is essentially what it is. But the 4B extends over to, like, parks, uh, facilities, uh, amateur sports and entertainment and all of that, correct? It does, it does. And this policy doesn't specifically encourage that. Um, I think we could, if we had the right entertainment project, um, it would make sense to pay for it out of this fund. Um, however, things like parks improvements, we budget for those in our, in our general fund and our capital improvements mm -hmm. fund. So we, we want to protect this economic development fund um, from those kinds of uses. Those are very valid uses, <laughs> don't get me wrong, um, but this is just trying to segregate more money for this type of, of event. Okay. So I don't know if this is the appropriate time to ask this question, but have we spent um, dollars out of this fund? And we have not. Um, part of the point of the fund was we needed enough money to make a real impact on a project um, and to, to Peeling away small pieces we felt like, staff felt like, was not the highest and best use. We kind of wanted to save it so that we could make a big impact on an incredibly important project, one of those projects that we might lose if we don't have this ability. So we, we hope to be very judicious um, with those funds. Okay, Mr. Anderson. That's, that is all I have oh. for this presentation. <laughs> okay. Uh, earlier you, you mentioned about area of a development, uh, develop too fast, uh, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Now, could there be a fast development but uncontrolled of an ordinance? In that way, uh, we could at least 
take in the development, but control it by an ordinance. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's that's part of what I see as my job as an economic developer is, mm -hmm. is to assist the city to ensure that, that our ordinances are responding to what's currently happening in the community um, from housing or commercial development or mm -hmm. industrial development and and kind of stay out ahead of those and and so that we can ordinances can be changed pretty quickly in a town in a small town and so if we have fast development occurring um, as long as we have a good comprehensive plan behind us we, we can make those decisions as a community and respond fairly quickly mm -hmm. It is important, though, that we have those basic pieces of that comprehensive plan to support those decisions. What, what would you say would be pieces we are missing uh, in our process of development, uh, economic development? I mean, like area. We, as we don't have an area to uh, support some industries, correct? That is correct. That is probably my biggest hurdle. My two biggest hurdles are flat, utility-served, rail-served sites. Um, and then my other hurdle is if I had the perfect 300-acre rail-served, utility-served site and there's another similar community that had the exact same thing, that community can offer a cash grant for every job they create, and we cannot unless we, we fund it out of that economic development fund. So those are really my two biggest hurdles are, are truly funding, um, and then site development, which also ties back to funding. Right. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate you delving into all the activities and priorities. I think that was very, very helpful. And um, I'm assuming that you're going to get some evaluation measures that align with those uh, priorities and activities. Yes. And, um, each, each one of these agreements has performance measures in them. And so as we, um, as we enter into the agreements, they have their own specific performance measures. And then at the end of each year, we can certainly show you how our agreements throughout the year have reflected those priorities. So my question is a little broader because so much of what you do is um, leading up to some big project. So I know mm -hmm. we can evaluate the big project mm -hmm. and the impact it has on our community, but some of these are process mm -hmm. kinds of things. So I hope that we can develop mm -hmm. some evaluation measures so that we can see you know, how many um, small businesses we've saved or how many small businesses we've encouraged to expand even if they didn't use this fund. Certainly. So I, I, um, I, that's part of the reason I appreciated those activities and priorities mm -hmm. because I think there can be measures lined up just with those to help us and to help us answer questions to the people who ask us about um, all these efforts. Certainly, and, and I appreciate that. And we will, um, coming up in September, provide an annual report showing um, not only the true economic things that we can measure, job growth, job losses, sales tax, things like that, but then also just a general reporting of activities and show, you know, we made this many business contacts. These are some of the success stories um, so that you can truly see some of some of those processes that are hard to, to attach a number to, um, but then we can, we can give some success stories out of those as well. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Anderson. No, I, I appreciate the presentation and uh, I, I look forward to finding ways that we can bolster our economic development uh, opportunities here and find ways for the city to support that even more than it has been able to in the past. Uh, thank, thank you, God. Yeah, the detail is great. It's, it's what we've thank needed, you. what we've talked about. So thank you. thanks for doing that. We will later on the agenda, on the regular agenda, um, have this policy. These two policies are on your agenda for approval. Um, and we'll do that before um, our 380 agreement that we have presented to you tonight as well. Thank you. Okay. So we'll we'll now have uh, an executive session uh, pursuant to Texas Government Code 551.087, and we'll dismiss to another room, and we'll be back shortly. Okay, it is 5:30, and we will reopen our regular meeting. Uh, the first thing we have on the agenda is open forum. Open forum is the public's opportunity to address the council on any matter related to the city 
that is not on tonight's agenda. Your comments are limited to three minutes and in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, the City Council generally cannot discuss, consider, or take action on matters not listed on the agenda. We have two tonight to speak and the first is Ms. Laster. Hi, Council. Hello. So, um, at the last City Council meeting two weeks ago, there was an inclusion and diversity program that was proposed. It was stated by Councilwoman Fisher, I'm sad to see he's not here tonight, that everyone she talked to thought it was a great idea. Well, I just wanted to let the council know that there are many other opinions out there. So um, I'm not going to speak today against the program because I don't think it's up for a vote tonight. So, um, but we will come back to speak on it when it comes up for a vote. But I would like to submit to the council a petition signed by around 400 taxpayers. This was gathered in just six days, um, adamantly against the creation of such a program. Whether you call it inclusion, diversity, community outreach, community engagement, it's all the same thing. Um, we believe it to be unnecessary and wasteful. So thank you for your time. And we do have another speaker tonight, uh, Mr. Engler. This is the only place where I can see you. You are a busy man. <laughs> I'm just coming as a concerned citizen and someone who wants to see the city do a little better. I want to talk about and bring to the city's attention the intersection up at Industrial Drive and 259, <clears throat> the northeast quadrant of that is very heavily overgrown. We have a, uh, a policy and ordinance in the city of overgrown property, do we not? That being in the city, I would really like to see the city take action on that and do whatever they need to do to get that corner cleaned up, mowed, whatever it is, or the landowner, which I think belongs to Mr. Dillon. My wife told me that. She keeps me informed of all the statistics. But anyway, if we could, if we could see about doing something about that, I'm bringing it to the city's attention. Thank you, Mr. Engler. Okay, so from there we'll move on to the consent agenda. Uh, is there anything that needs to be removed from the consent agenda? Um, I'd like to just speak to it briefly without removing them from the consent agenda. So I'll say what I... I think that was a yes, that's appropriate. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, the contracts for the city roadside litter pickup and the litter pickup at the city parks, I'm all for that. We really do need... Um, uh, some assistance in picking up litter, but I would really hope we can contract with people from Nacogdoches, and those are from Lufkin. Even though they're a great organization, um, I will keep saying I hope we can do business with Nacogdoches people. I think that's well said. said. Thank, thank you. I have a question on one of the issues. The same thing uh, on the roadside pickup. Uh, who would be able to answer that question? Uh, <coughs> oh, sure, Mr. Bray. I didn't see you back there. Sorry. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor. Brian yeah, Bray. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, the, it's contracted out to a, a particular business, and then that business hires the employees? <clears throat> Correct. The, the contract is with um, a state agency who mm -hmm. then hires Oak Creek, who is our local Correct. or regional oh, yeah. company. And, and they employ people from the surrounding area. They're based in Lufkin, and they have, I couldn't tell you how far, outreaching they are, um, but they do have employees from outside of Lufkin as well. And is that basically uh, employees uh, with 
disability? Yes, sir, that is correct. They employ 100% um, people with disabilities. And, and there, my question is going to be a, their wage scale. Are they paid, uh, you know, regular wages, or is that reduced wage wages? I can find the answer for that, but I do not know yeah, what I'd their like pay scale have is. That yes, sir. That I will. Okay. Thank you. Since we're paying thirty-eight dollars an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Right. Okay. I want to make sure they've been paid sufficiently. I understand. Because I agree. People with local get paid. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So, no other questions. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll second. Second. Any further discussion? Those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. All right. We'll move on to our regular agenda, uh, number nine. Receive presentation of the 2021 Texas Blueberry Festival. Uh, Wayne Mitchell with the Chamber of Commerce and Grace Handler, Blueberry Festival Committee. Thank you all. Good evening, Council. How are we tonight? Great. 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 I have a copy of the presentation for you guys. I can't. 31st Texas Blueberry Festival. What a great event. Um, there's a lot that I want to say uh, to thank everyone. And because of the support of the city of Nacogdoches, and I'm going to let you guys read the slides. I'll probably try not to say too much of it. I just want to put in my two cents here and there. Thousands of residents enjoyed a wonderful day. Thousands. You know, that was awesome. We celebrated our diverse cultures. We attracted visitors to our area from all over, and we promoted the Texas blueberry industry to America. And we were able to do it and provide a safe and exciting family event. So for those of you that were there, you could see that it was fun. What did people tell us? And you guys can read the slide, but I'm gonna tell you what I heard from the uh, vendors, what I heard from people that were just attending. They said, I would ask them, why, what brought you here? What brought them here? was to get out of the home to show that their children that there is life beyond the screen because with everything that impacted us in 2020 everybody was excited to get out let their children and let their family see things again and know that there was life outside of the house what was new there was a lot of things that was new this year first of all we had our presenting sponsor tipton ford he offered the photo op with the Blueberry Festival Ford F1 on the square, the Sasquatch Off-Road Adventure Club. Uh, Surf Pro had a Texas size selfie. Um, a bagpipe player was running around and having fun, even led the pet parade. We had running of the blueberries and that added a 10K and a one mile and it uh, attracted over 380 participants. This event raised over $13,000 for the Nacogdoches Dog Park. One of my favorite was, of course, the children's area. We added the circus theme this year, which was really fun and exciting for all that attended. And then doing our part, the Nacogdoches Fire and Safety Department uh, vaccinated approximately 65 during the festival. Masks were available at the chamber booth for anyone that wanted to mask up. Sanitizer was available all throughout uh, the festival site and water was available to several at several different vendor locations as well as downtown. Music. Everybody wants music. It's fun. So music, music, music. We featured 20 live entertainment acts on three stages including two performances by the Alabama Cushata Tribe of Texas. They also displayed art and other culture items in the Commercial Bank of Texas lobby. Uh, the Bluegrass Concert, which you'll hear more of later, and then just all the different music venues that was available that led all through. Business promotion and media attention. In addition to the Texas Blueberry Festival Bluegrass Concert in the park, the chamber 
enjoyed promoting all the blueberry activities that were going on in Nacogdoches before and after the blueberry peak. The chamber works with the local media to promote Festival Weekend in local East Texas markets. We appreciate the support from KTRE-TV, the Daily Sentinel, KSWP, KABX, Christian Radio, Town Square Media, 103 The Bull. And I cannot tell you how much it was and how much it meant to me that we greatly, greatly appreciated the partnership with Sherry Morgan in her Visit Nacogdoches team. This was incredible. And then I'll go in and tell you who else I'm grateful and thankful for in just a moment. The Texas Blueberry Festival is an attractive public event that catches media attention. It's a good way to bring positive attention to Nacogdoches. And of course, we cannot do this without our sponsors, City of Nacogdoches, Pilgrims, Batters Law Firm, RV Outfitter, Regions Bank, Universal Rentals, University Rentals, Citizens One Bank, Chill Nack, Raisin Cane's Chicken Finger, U-Bank, XLER, Gown Chevrolet, Harry's Building Materi, McWilliams and Sun Heating and Air Conditioning, Southside Bank, Around the Town, Austin Bank, Bank Court South, BXS Insurance, ETEC, and the Daily Sentinel. Anybody say pancakes? <laughs> if you didn't get your pancakes, I'm so sorry because there were 1,500 plates of blueberry pancakes that were served. That's 4,500 plus pancakes. Can you imagine eating those pancakes? Mm -mm. And then we have some celebrities that gave of their time, and that is Mario and Jennifer Canizares, Jimmy and Lisa Mize. Scott and Sheree Gordon, Gabriel and Deborah Trujillo. And then this is where I want to say thanks, and I'm going to turn around a little bit because some of those people are in the room. I want to thank you guys for the ones that actually reached out and helped with the pancakes. But I also want to thank our city, our city staff, Brian Bray and his staff, the Nacogdoches PD and fire department and their staff, the city works in their department. I just want to tell you guys that that was awesome. The addition of White Electric made this festival flawless. I cannot thank y'all enough for that because they were there and they fixed a problem before it happened. You know, before I even got there and I say that, but it felt like it. Um, this has been the best Texas Blueberry Festival that I've had the pleasure to, to be a part of out of the nine years. And we can't do it without our partners. So, oh, didn't flip. So our partners, there's a whole list of them. City of Nacogdoches, Keep Nacogdoches Beautiful, Again Batters Law Firm, Pilgrims RV, The Blueberry Place, Brookshire Brothers, Kiwanis, SFA Drive-In, SFASU Hospital, Hospitality, Texas A&M, AgriLife Extension, Visit NAC. There's just so many more, and I'll let you guys read that. Our volunteers. Our volunteers are awesome. We have the best city, the best community that anybody could ask for. I am not a Ben, and I got here as fast as I could, and I am so pleased and honored to be a part of Nacogdoches. So... I want to thank all the volunteers, and we have a little slide for you. Presentation. Here we go. Oh, plan to attend the 32nd Annual Texas Blueberry Festival, June 11th, 2022. Here we go. After we're done, if you don't mind, can we take a photo real quick? Sure. After the clock's done. Uh, very hard. <laughs>
Thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm Angela Weirhold with Point A Media, and this is Scott Waller. Scott Waller with XCTX, and we are part of the Bee Gees. Um, the Bluegrass Committee. Um, we want to say thank you uh, to the council for the opportunity to report on our bluegrass, Blueberry Bluegrass concert in the park held Friday night, June 10th, in downtown Nacogdoches in our beautiful Festival Park. I never use one of these things, right? Oh, there we go. Okay. Thank you to the members of the city council and thank you to city staff and professionals for your support of our concert. This year our concert was the biggest, uh, the most well attended event we've ever had. We estimate between four and 5,000 people were at our concert and it truly was the biggest ever. Our committee's goals for the concert are really to uh, like make people feel like they're coming into our home. Um, we welcome our visitors, our community into the concert as they arrive. We've got tons of volunteers that drive golf carts to a great number of folks that are mobility challenged. They wouldn't be able to attend otherwise. Um, we get food, we got food and merchandise vendors. We're very honored that the SFA Alumni Association, their buses take folks from First Baptist Church, which we completely fill up that parking lot. That relieves a whole lot of pressure on downtown parking lot and brings our folks right to the concert um, downtown. Things we knew about Bluegrass when we started, people love it. They're willing to travel long distances to hear great bands. They value the experience of live music performed well. Bluegrass music is really all about family, as you'll see from these photos. Um, they, they, they love it, and it's all about family, and we believe that, that genre of music really fit with Nacogdoches. Um, we're extremely grateful to our sponsor, Rex Perry Autoplex. Um, his generous donation gives us the ability to draw those large crowds that we've had over the past six years. Rex saw the vision, our vision of the event when we started was to encourage people to come early, stay the day, uh, spend the day with us, shop, eat, and stay the night to attend the Texas Blueberry Festival the next day and experience firsthand what makes our Nacogdoches so special. And folks, this is really what it's all about. Um, our concert is, is very different in that we draw folks of all ages, even lots of furry friends on leashes. They're all welcome. This concert is a great quality of life experience uh, for those that live in our community, that you get to come downtown in a beautiful park and experience on a Friday night and attend a free concert. I mean, it's, it's great for our, our folks, too. We promoted the Blueberry Bluegrass Concert in the Park on our Facebook page and we reached an average of 3,100 people a day with an average engagement of 177 folks. We tracked a whole total of 113,000 impressions. Our Facebook event page alone reached 19,000 people and garnered over 1,100 re event responses. Our audience really included a wide range of folks, but the majority of those fell in the 35 to 44 year old range, but the 25 to 34 was a close second. 40% of those people reached live in Nacogdoches County, which means 60% of those reached did not. So we had a wide range of folks and a large, we covered a large area. On Instagram, we're new to Instagram. We gained 23 new followers and reached 374 accounts. Um, in the month and a half that we invested in real search engine marketing for the concert, we tracked almost 68,000 impressions and almost 4,500 clicks. We tracked 73,000 impressions on Google with 1,076 clicks. We used our Facebook post. We um, featured all that we could and all that is wonderful about Nacogdoches. This one post here reached over 13,000 people, had over 18 engagements and 23 shares. We used our, our Facebook and all of our social media to promote our community, eating locally, shopping locally, and all of the events that were going on in our community over the weekend from Miller's Crossings, Blueberry, jo Blueberry Jam on Thursday night, the Texas Blueberry Festival on Saturday, and the Cody Johnson concert on Saturday night at the Expo. Here is Scott to recap our survey results. So we do take a survey of all of our... So we give out door prizes to those who complete surveys, and we had 106 respondents to our survey, and 57% uh, were from Nacogdoches County, which means 43% were from outside Nacogdoches County. And of all the respondents, 26 percent uh, stayed the night. Th those were visitors that stayed overnight. And we know that five and a half percent of the total respondents, this was their very first visit ever to Nacogdoches, and we consider that a big win. Um, 
So 15% uh, of the people who stayed overnight um, stayed with family and friends. We realized they didn't uh, pay a hotel motel tax for that, but, but they still spent money, restaurants and gas stations and things of that nature. 4.6% uh, stayed in RV parks, 12% stayed in bed and breakfast, and then 5.5% stayed in hotels. So we feel really good about that. And then uh, this year we had for the bands, we had uh, the Gent Mountain, uh, the Gent Mountain Grass Burrs. They were from uh, just out up the road in uh, Jacksonville. We also had Hickory Hill. We had uh, the Farm Hands. And we also had the Purple Hulls. And then here's Angela again. We just really want to thank you everyone that helped us it, it, it as, as grace alluded it takes it takes everyone it take we <coughs> really want to thank the city council obviously for supporting the concert through the city services that you gave us um, we also want to incl include motorhomes of texas sfa alumni at first baptist church at lazarus park we had lots of support with the county reserves they came and helped us at the end of the night to clean up and pack up because we wanted the park to be beautiful for all the activities that were going to go on saturday of course, the Chamber of Commerce are a very valuable partner in promoting our event. Visit Nacogdoches, Joanna, Sherry, their team helped us a great deal uh, with all sorts of important things that helped make the concert really become absolutely flawless. And um, so really we just want to say thank you. And um, thanks to all of our committee. We have a, a great and wonderful, hardworking committee. And uh, it's all going to be possible. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you. It was just wonderful, and I, <clears throat> I just wanted to say I, I really appreciate the concert to keep people overnight. I thought that was a wonderful idea, and it was well-staffed, and our city staff, I agree, did an excellent job. Thank you for everything. Yes, and I want to say that this is one of the opportunity times when you are at this festival. You're going to meet someone you don't know, and there's going to be something that happens that you can start a conversation. And this is the opportunity. Uh, they're going to say, uh, this is the best festival I've ever been to. And then you would say, it gets better next year, return. <laughs> and not only that, you can come to Nacogdoches anytime. So mm -hmm. that's the opportunity to communicate with, at that time they are visitors. But the next time they'll be your guest. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation and that, you know, the, the event was fantastic. I think everybody was very ready for it after l missing it last year and uh, it, it was uh, so well done. And I also appreciate um, all of the, the analytic data that, that actually, that's, to me, that's interesting because it, you know, it, it helps inform um, how, how we kind of market the thing in the future. So. Um, I, I appreciate the whole thing. Thank you very much for all the hard work. Yeah, it was great. And certainly appreciate you giving the presentation and not <coughs> leaving it to your chairman, uh, <laughs> Mr. Smith. <laughs> I'm a supervisor by nature. <laughs> so we'll have a picture. Thank you again. We really do appreciate the work of the Chamber of Commerce. We'll move on to uh, B in our regular agenda. Consider Ordinance Number 1874-08-21, establishing an economic development program pursuant to Chapter 380 of the Local Government Code to be administered by the Economic Development Corporation, Economic Development Department, Economic Development Director, Larissa Philpott. 
Council members, I don't have anything to add um, to our earlier workshop session. Just wanted to be here to answer any questions that you might have before you consider this. Okay. Any any other questions? I think we've asked some. I don't have any further. Okay. Do we have a motion to approve? I'll, I'll move that we approve uh, 9B as written. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? Okay, those in favor signify saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. All right. Okay, we'll move on to C. Uh, consider approval of resolution number 1276-08-21, creating a Chapter 380 Economic Development Program and authorizing agreement by and between the City of Nacogdoches and HCH Aviation LLC regarding development of a flight school at A.O. Mangum Region A.O. Mangum Jr. Regional Airport. Uh, Economic Development Director, uh, Larissa Philpott. Yes, sir. Um, I will just open the discussion um, by saying this is our first um, item under the what you just approved 30 seconds ago. Um, we have been working for some time with HCH Aviation. Stephen F. Austin State University has been working with them on developing um, an aviation sciences program in conjunction with the F an official FAA part 141 and 61 flight school. Um, Joe Cephalou at the airport and Steve Bartlett at the airport have been working hard on determining all of the improvements to be made. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Shannon Conklin with HCH to give you a little bit of an overview of the program. Thank you, Larissa. Uh, thank you to the, the City Council and Mr. Mayor. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. My name is Shannon Conklin. Um, I also want to take a moment, you know, as I look around the room a while ago, it, uh, it reminds me of uh, how proud I am, my wife and I, are to be a part of the community when you look and see the great people uh, and fellow citizens here. So uh, thank you for the, uh, the time and, and uh, giving, giving me a few minutes to speak here. I'd also like to recognize the ACH team that's here, the boss, the real boss being my wife. Uh, I know Melissa and there are several others that are here. Um, thank you for their support. I always get the de facto position of being able to come up and speak, so I drew the short straw again, um, so I'm here. I would like to take a moment. Uh, one, some of the great things of this program have already starting to play out. Um, one of those is uh, I'd like to welcome two people to the city of Nacogdoches, and that's Jim Williams. Uh, who has joined the city as the aviation director um, for SFA. Uh, Jim is um, a former fighter pilot and retired fighter pilot, um, also a retired captain with United Airlines and has decades of experience in aviation. He's relocated from Florida here to uh, be a part of that, so that's a great thing. Also joining us tonight is uh, Jack Gaynor. You can raise your hand there. Jack is also retired military and also... Um, has been in the civilian side of flight training for a number of years now. He has joined the ACH team as our chief flight instructor uh, and will be leading the charge uh, as we embark on this endeavor uh, coming up. I will, in the interest of time, I was told by Larissa that I had to do a lot of push-ups if I don't keep this uh, at a nice pace, so uh, I don't want to do that this evening. So I will probably uh, uh, skip around a little bit as we go through this. Uh, one thing, in, oh, I miss. well, you messed up my, there's some things missing here. Uh, that's okay, though. That's okay. She told me that it was uh, brought down. We'll talk about five things here, five phases about the program um, and how this is going to, how this will develop over the next five to ten years. So I'll briefly talk about those in just a minute as we go through this. Um, quick introduction. I, I know many of you and very honored to know you. I um, know many of the people here in the room, but my wife and I are from Nacogdoches. We're raised in Nacogdoches. Um, my wife's family and um, the Hughes's and Hasbins, their family, have been here for multi-generations and a big part of the community. Um, in 2016, we decided to move back to Nacogdoches and uh, raise our children. Um, we love this community with everything we have. It's very important to us. Um, and we wanted to do anything that we could to help promote the community and promote the citizens uh, and young people of this community. ACH was born in 2019 out of a happen-chance meeting with uh, Dr. Todd Brown, my good friend, um, with SFA. Um, really right before 2019, 2018, he and I were just having a conversation uh, around the university looking to bring a professional fr pl uh, flight program to SFA um, and searching for a partnership uh, to do that. Um, 
about a year, fast forward about a year later in 2019, um, they had not found that partner yet, and that's when my wife and I decided maybe there's a great opportunity here um, to help the university and help our city here, um, and that's really where what set the, the ball in motion to where we are today. So um, ACH is a woman-owned SFA alum business, and uh, um, in addition, we have the Hughes and the Hasbins that are part of the program principals in this. So. Um, it's uh, it's uh, been a great, great uh, um, uh, journey so far. The mission, it's really quite simple. Um, right now, it, our mission is to introduce young people to the field of aviation. And we'll talk a little bit more how we're going to accomplish that. But we believe that we're in a great place here in East Texas with the development of I-69, with our university, this great city, our airport, which has a lot of just open ground there for development. We believe that there's a wonderful opportunity to bring a flight program to SFA that can really be an outreach to young people and get them involved in aviation. Um, and we'll talk a minute, but, you know, getting them exposed to aviation, whether to be pilots or to just get into aviation management, to get into airport management. There's a whole field out there of things that young people can get introduced to. So that is really our mission. Um, you know, we, we really believe in investing in our youth, and we need to and need to, and do everything we can to, um, to help develop them. The other is to build really a, 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 well, to build a gold standard of a professional flight program here in Nacogdoches with SFA. Uh, there is no reason, and we've, uh, we're talking with Mr. Wh Jim Williams and, and Jack, our mission is to build a program that will absolutely become recognized on the world stage as an ec a, a, a school of excellent and professional training. We want to knock down the North Dakotas, the Purdue's, the Emory Riddles, and there's no reason why we can't. The way we're building this program up, I can assure you we will rank up at the top and if not surpass those institutions, and we have every bit of the opportunity to do it right here in Nacogdoches. The, the thing that we saw when we built this program is, is not to do it the same way the other schools are doing it. They're over-promising and under-delivering almost every level. We wanted to be completely transparent with students. We wanted to bring them a cost-effective program, and in doing so, bring brand new airplanes, brand new simulators, state-of-the-art facilities, but bring it to them at a value that they can afford and that they can take forward into a career. A lot of these schools have commercialized this too much, and they have over-promised and under-delivered, and the students are left with it. What we're doing with the partnerships here with the city, the partnerships that we've established with businesses here in the community, and like the Bryant Foundation and Elliott Electric and many others, is their, their investment in resources, i.e. the Bright Foundation into simulators that we have brought over to the to SFA that are sitting there now, are enabling us to keep this program at a very cost-effective program for the kids, and we're passing on every bit of that to the young people. Our program is designed right now. What they come out with is, in, in these new airplanes with state-of-the-art equipment, is 25 to 30% less than any other like program out there, anywhere. And uh, it's just a testament to the community getting behind it. The other great product, byproduct of creating this program in this phase one is that we get to help to grow the airport. We put the airport on the map further than what it is today. The students that come to Nacogdoches, and we really we, we envision bringing in students from all over the world at some point. But when you start bringing in students from all over the world, you've got siblings now that are coming to Nacogdoches to study in the STEM building, study in education, uh, the nurse sciences. Um, there's a great opportunity to, to really bring in more students than just aviation, so we do believe that's going to happen. And then the, clearly what we've already set, seen in motion here um, is the professionals that we're bringing to Nacogdoches. These are six-figure positions, many of these folks that are going to be coming in and help training and running these programs, uh, and we already have two that have relocated here. Larissa or someone, make sure, get on me if I'm not... Uh, so phase one, I, I don't think that's on there. Yep, well, nope, oh, right there, sorry. So phase one, right, the, the, we formed a, 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 a P3 relationship with the university. Uh, that was uh, solidified this year. Pro, it's a public-private partnership with SFA um, to, to offer the flight training portion of this. Students will come out with a four-year degree with SFA in aviation sciences. Uh, the students will earn their private instrument, commercial, multi, CFI, and double I ratings when they come out.
they'll be well positioned to go into the, the commercial world, either flying charter, working for the airlines, whatever the case may be. We really would like to use many of these students to stay with us and help us train the next generation of pilots too. So there'll be great opportunities here for those students who may decide to move on to work on their masters or advanced degrees. They can stay here and, and work and, and make good money um, as well. Um, go a little bit further here. So phase one with this is um, first year is our goal is to hit 27 students that are in part of the collegiate program. Um, in doing so, um, uh, that'll allow us to, you know, I've, some have heard me say this before, the crawl, walk, run. 27 is a manageable program. We'll be able to get these students in and get them going. Um, we have th three brand new airplanes that'll be here next week, two of them next week and another one in the following week. These are straight off the factory line um, of Piper factory. Um, we're in the process of ordering two or three more airplanes um, to be here next summer to expand the program um, and also bringing in two newer twin engine aircraft here in the next two to three months. Um, the goal is second year we'll bring in 50 students, 75, fourth year 20, 125 students. We really believe that, uh, that, that you know, there's, a, there's an opportunity to hit 150 to 200 kids here in the program. At some point you get to, a, uh, you know, you get so, so big that you're going to need more infrastructure uh, at the airport. So we're even looking at secondary plans of how do, we, how do we reallocate some of these youth and stage them in Lufkin possibly and continue to bring folks into the community in SFA. Overall, the program will grow to about 16 aircraft to 20 aircraft. Now, this is specifically for the flight program uh, or the, the uh, flight training program um, and then four single engine aircraft too as well. Real quick, this is just an overview of the aircraft that are going to be used. Um, it's the Piper 100 trainer aircraft. It's a wonderful airplane, um, all glass cockpit technology in the aircraft, uh, advanced uh, systems with autopilot, navigation aids, et cetera. So the students are going to be learning in some of the best equipment that's out there. The simulators, these simulators are already sitting at the S at SFA in the classroom. Uh, we have a full motion simulator that's, uh, um, this is not the actual picture, it's the actual model, but uh, it's emblazoned with SFA uh, on the side. Uh, we've, we've tried to send around quite a few pictures on that. Um, and we have two of these desktop models that students can fly at any point. Um, these are certified flight training devices, advanced uh, training devices. So students who fly on this or the full motion simulator um, will be able to log that time uh, towards their total hours, which is great. Uh, really, when we, during phase one, we talk about the simulators, who's going to have access to them? And again, let me back up just for a second. You know, we want to build a, su a, su a successful program here training students, but we also want to give back to the community and expose youth to, to, to flight. Um, so who are we going to serve with these, these simulators? It's existing students, clearly, that are enrolled in the program. Prospective students that will come visiting here, their families come here, whether they're touring SFA or whatever the case may be, they'll have access to fly the simulators as well. Local and regional kids, and this is where it starts getting, you know, this is my passion about it. Getting the East Texas kids, uh, high school, junior high kids involved, and let them go fly these simulators. Let them log time, actually, and we'll speak a little bit about uh, some of the things they get to take away from it. And also our community pilots. I look in here and I see some fellow aviators that are in here. Um, we want them to be safe. And so uh, if they need to come in and train and do recurrency checks or just freshen up or if they're going on a trip and they've never been to a certain airport and they want to come in and actually fly that route and land at that airport, they can come in at no cost. Come in, we'll actually have an instructor that can help them if they need it. Um, they can fly the full motion or they can fly the fixed base model, but they can also um, stay proficient. We want them to enjoy tra air travel but come back home and be safe as well. So um, really giving back on that side. The community out, uh, I keep forgetting to change this. You know, I, I, I firmly believe that our youth is the most valuable yet the most neglected resource we have. I firmly believe that we all as citizens have a responsibility to help develop our youth. Uh, they are our future, and uh, we've got to do everything we can today to make sure they're set up for success. This flight program is students that come out of this uh, program with a professional flight training and flight licenses and the degree can go on to work at the big carriers where the median salary is over $140,000 a year. 
that's an incredible opportunity for folks uh, it, it, to go to a four-year, get a four-year degree, uh, work about 10 or 11 days a month, and uh, make that kind of money. And I know Kerry, Kerry Pruitt, who's here today as an airline captain with American, can attest to the great opportunities that are there. And by the way, Kerry and Lori uh, have, a, have a daughter who's also a flight instructor and working towards uh, going to work for the big leagues. So um, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. The first step program of what we're going to offer also with the simulators and the outreach to uh, at SFA and at the airport is what we call the first step program. Our commitment is, uh, at HCH is to bring a thousand kids minimum a year into our flight labs or the airport to expose them to aviation. The goal here is not to turn every kid into being a pilot. The goal is is to open up the 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 let kids dream, let children think about what they can accomplish and that they can be pilots. When they fly that simulator and know that they can take an airplane off and land that airplane, it allows them to broaden their, their vision and broaden their, uh, their dreams. And we all know that some of the, hard, the hardest thing in conquering a dream is really taking the first step many times. It's taking that first step and moving forward towards, towards a dream that's the hardest. So bringing kids in, we know that they're not all going to go on to be pilots, um, but what we want when they come out of this, every student's going to get a logbook, and they get to log that time with an instructor. They can take that logbook and put it up on a shelf. They can look at it, and hopefully down the road when that young girl or that young man is sitting in a, in a college room or, or, or preparing for a test or looking for a job, preparing for that job, they can look to that book and it be a, something that reminds them that they can go out and conquer anything they want. All they have to do is really take that first step. And so we... We hope that logbook could go on to be used for, uh, to log actual flight training or it be a symbol of hope for them and to remind them they can do anything they put their mind to. But our goal is to do well over 1,000 kids a year into our lab. I keep forgetting to change this. Sorry, guys. Keep talking. Drone program, it's a really easy add-in here. We're already working on bringing that program. Chief Gaynor is uh, looking to bring that in. The, the drone, you, you, could, you can't pick up a, a paper anywhere without seeing or looking at an article where drones have become part of our everyday life, uh, from mapping agriculture, military, law enforcement, et cetera. So um, that program will also be offered at SFA, or excuse me, uh, in ACH. Um, real quick, air track uh, phase two, as we go into the aircraft training side of it, this, this is really as we start to embark on our five-year and ten-year plan. Um, is to, act, to bring in an um, a aircraft technician training program that uh, will first start out next year with 20 kids and grow to well over 100. We really think that we can actually be at 200, 300 kids in that program. Um, you don't need a, a huge footprint to, to house them. Um, we already have a 10,000 square foot hangar that's going in at the airport, be the largest hangar. We're looking to even build larger hangars there in the next two years, um, up to having four to five hangars there. So there's going to be plenty of space. Um, but we really think this could be a great program for kids. If they don't want to fly, we can get them involved in being an aircraft technician. The jobs uh, w in, the, in the field of aviation, commercial aviation for aircraft technicians is 74000 In many cases for the airlines, it's over 100000 a year. Phase three will be, which is a, a natural dovetail off the aircraft technician, is the, the um, uh, maintenance operation, so being able to provide maintenance, uh, really a nose-to-tail uh, maintenance program here at SFA, or excuse me, at, uh, at the airport. Um, we're not looking to replace anyone that's doing work here today. We're looking at bringing in larger jets, larger aircraft where we can uh, service, those, service that equipment. And then uh, get into aircraft sales. Natural from there is uh, used in new airplanes. We really want to look at uh, buying airplanes and refurbing them and putting those aircraft back on the market, whether it be uh, light jets uh, to uh, twin-engine aircraft, you name it, even helicopters. Um, but it's a natural fit into this, and this, again, falls within the 5- to 10-year plan. And then I will go into the last, a charter operation. Where we feel like this can be beneficial is you know, Nacogdoches is not going to have the airlines come back to Nacogdoches anytime soon. It doesn't make sense with I-69 maturing, uh, the corridor maturing, um, the close proximity to both Tyler, Longview, Shreveport, and Houston. But we, what we do think is that a, an affordable opportunity with aircraft from single engine, smaller four-seater single engine aircraft, to jets, light jets, small twins, does play a part in local businesses for the attraction of local business, but also local businesses that are here that are looking to further their footprint out. 
And if they're able to do that, that means they're bringing in more resources into the community to help support those operations. And we feel like there's a great opportunity here to be able to offer those kind of services as well. Um, I think that's it. Let's just get through it. Anything else? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you for that, for the introduction to the specific project. Um, I will go over just what some of the specific, specifics of the agreement are. The per, it is performance-based, um, based upon first that agreement with SFA. Um, so many of our projects have a, have a large economic impact on the community, but this one has, has an especially important impact because it helps us grow enrollment at SFA. For every thousand students SFA increases, we see a direct or an indirect economic impact of over $16 million. And so you can see how important it is to do projects that, that affiliate with SFA. Their performance is also based on enrollment, um, and those are figures provided to us by HCH and also their employment. Um, and as Shannon mentioned, um, these are, are well-paying jobs, um, and also their enrollment, they're producing students that will, will go out and get well-paying jobs as well and hopefully reinvest back in their university and back in our community at some point. There is a tax rebate based on performance, um, and it is a rebate. Remember that they pay taxes on the hangers and the planes and then are rebated based on meeting their performance standards. So if they miss a target, then their rebate is reduced by, this, by the same amount. There is a reimbursement for public improvements. So the improvements that are proposed, and I'll detail those in a minute, are improvements that are necessary at the airport for any future development like this. Um, these are public improvements that would service not only this facility, but future phases of this facility, as well as future businesses out there. Um, and so they're, they're necessary for our airport to grow. The economic impact is based on um, some revenues to the city from a ground lease, from a couple of fixed base operator agreements, fuel sales. We will, of course, increase that, that air traffic and sell more fuel and then those ad valorem taxes that we mentioned, as well as the increased SFA enrollment. A 10-year indirect impact is gonna be $19 million to our local community, and that's pretty conservative. That's, that's certainly not capturing every bit of that impact, um, and that's only over 10 years. The, the economic impact um, on the other side of the equation, the tax rebate, that's an estimated number, because that is based on, on the final valuation and, and depreciation of those planes. And so we will know that um, once we get that final valuation of the planes. It's important to note, though, there is no decrease in revenue from the city from today's revenue. Today we have no revenue <laughs> off of the flight school. We have no ad valorem taxes off of um, HCH. So we're only rebating the new valuation that we get. Um, rebating only upon performance, and this is a 10-year agreement. The public improvements are shown next there. You'll see a sewer system that's an on-site septic system, which is what we have to utilize at the airport due to its distance from our, our local city sewer lines of $8,000, $100,000 water line, storm drainage, um, $30,000, and then paving um, essentially a new driveway, a new entrance, as well as a new parking area, and the sum of those is about $688,000. This entire package was vetted by the Economic Incentive Review Committee that we discussed in the program, in the Chapter 380 program policy you saw earlier. We do have several of those members here tonight. I think Scott Boyer was here earlier and had to leave. Um, Garth Hens, Ron Collins, Francis Spruill are all here, um, and they all voiced their support for the project. We did have a couple of abstentions due to conflicts of interest with SFA, and so that was important for them to note. Um, everyone that we've spoken to is, is excited about the project and, and sees how it can continue to grow, not only this phase, but, but in future phases. Um, this could be a, a game changer for our airport and for economic activity um, at the airport. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay. Maybe public comment next. Anyone uh, in the want to speak to this? No comment? Okay. Council? Mr. Anderson? Um, I'd just like to say I am absolutely blown away by um, 
the the scope of this project and the timeline in which it was put together. Um, so all all credit to Mr. and Mrs. Conklin and all of their partners, the, the university, the city um, staff as well. Um, I, I'm very excited about the possibilities for this, and I, I do have one quick question for Mr. Conklin. You have you talked a lot about access um, for the youth to the program, which I think is an absolutely crucial thing. But I'm a little curious about access to a simulator for maybe a middle-aged guy. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can work something out. Okay. All right, all right. That that is all. But thank you very much, and thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Conklin. Um, I'm excited because uh, I'm a uh, I was a aviation electrician uh, for six years, and I just like walking around looking at planes. <laughs> but uh, with this, oh, is there going to be a requirement for a longer runway? Uh, uh, no, sir. Not okay. for this. Um, the runway is a mile long now, Ru Joe, 50, 5,000 5, feet, feet, roughly a mile long. Um, the aircraft are, uh, that we're using in this, even the twin engines, even the light jets, uh, King Airs, so forth, that would be possibly part of this and exist on the airport today all work well there. Okay. And, and you mentioned about the rating, like the private and instrumentation and the commercial. Is that going to be done in the simulator or is that actually has to be done in, in physical flight? So probably, and my chief is going to get, get on me here, 90-plus uh, percent of training is actually in flight. In flight uh, okay. the, the simulators will, will be used. Uh, uh, is that correct? Yeah, you got the thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> the simulators will be used for training. Um, you know, they can work on, they can, the, the good thing about the simulators are some of it's going to be used towards the statutory training of the, the student. But the student is going to have unlimited access, within reason, but unlimited, no-cost access to the simulators to train as much as they want. So they can log as many hours as they want. Only so much can go to their rating, but they can fly as much as they want. They can prepare for missions, whatever the case may be. But uh, most of it will be airplanes uh, that you'll see flying. And, and do we have updated instrumentation for, to be uh, rated in even private or commercial? Yes, sir. We have everything that's needed here at the airport. We do have an ILS approach, uh, so we have a, a precision approach into the airport. We have GPS approaches. Okay. Um, the students will also, there will be a, a list of approved airports. We have to submit a plan to the FAA on our 141 mm -hmm. certification. Uh, there's a list of approved airports that students may go train in. And clearly, uh, the close proximity to Houston, Tyler, uh, and Shreveport, students will be entering into those different airspaces for training as well at other airports. Thank you. I'm excited. <laughs> we'll, we'll take you flying. <laughs> well, first of all, I'd like to welcome our new families to Nacogdoches. We really are glad to have you here. So, um, and the other thing I wanted to say is that I just love this program, this idea. I love capitalizing on the strengths that we have in Nacogdoches. We have SFA. We have such wonderful, creative people. As I have said, oftentimes we have some of the best in the nation right here in Nacogdoches, and it's great to see the entrepreneurial skills being put to use for our whole city, for all of our population. Um, I don't see any downsides, and the only thing I have to say is I do believe that this program will be the best in the country. So, All right. Nothing else? Uh, do I have a motion? So moved. Move. Second. Second. All right. Any discussion? Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? All right. Thank you, Shannon. All right. We'll move on to, to D. Consider approval of the purchase of one Pierce 100 foot ascendant aerial tower <laughs> truck. <laughs> you left truck off. From Siddons Martin Emergency Group LLC through the HGAC Buy Cooperative Purchasing Program in the amount of a million four hundred and thirty thousand five hundred dollars and associated equipment not to exceed fifty thousand dollars. Fire Chief Kiplinger. Mayor and Council, Keith Kiplinger, I walked very quickly up here. 
not because I want you to get out of here quickly, because I want to, to get this vote done and over with. <laughs> uh, last month, we came to you with, uh, with a problem. Uh, two weeks ago, we came to you with what we believe is the right solution. We have concreted that tonight and are prepared to ask you uh, to approve our recommendation. Uh, this proposal will replace our 25-year-old 75-foot ladder truck, uh, which was involved in an accident. The, the estimate to repair it still far exceeds the value of that current asset. Uh, that truck has well uh, served our community well for 25 years, and it's, uh, it's beyond its uh, useful life. <clears throat> the truck we're proposing to purchase is a Pierce 100-foot Ascendant aerial tower on a Velocity cabin chassis. Uh, so we're going to get a 100-foot truck instead of a 75-foot truck. And why that matters is demonstrated here. That demonstrator was here uh, a number of weeks ago, and if you'll notice, it reaches the top of Steen Hall. Uh, we have not had a truck that would reach above the fifth floor of Steen uh, in many, many years, in 25 years, in fact. Um, the truck we're proposing to buy is a demonstrator. It has plus or minus 12,000 miles on it. It does come with a new vehicle warranty. We suspect it will have delivery within 30 days, possibly even sooner than that. Uh, and we're proposing to buy it through the HGAC cooperative purchasing contract. This piece of apparatus not only is taller and will do more things and help protect our citizens better, but it also has advanced capabilities. Instead of it being a ladder with a, just a ladder that sticks up in the air, this actually has a bucket. And so when you're trying to rescue somebody out of a creek or out of a burning building, they can step into the bucket and you can lower them to the ground, which is a much safer option um, than having a 19-year-old college student step out of a dorm room window. Uh, timeline and funding. Uh, a repayment resolution will appear on the August 17th agenda. Uh, the budget amendment and tax anticipation note will appear on a future agenda after that is worked out with the finance director and our financial advisors. Uh, we recommend approval, and I'll be happy to answer any questions after public comment. Great. Thank you. Any public comment? All right. Ms. Bellinger, I think you're up. You're not too excited about this, are you? <laughs> I, I, yes, ma'am. A little bit. Um, I only wanted to say, I, I meant to mention this before, but I do hope we look at that intersection um, where the, the accident happened before. I know there's several potential accidents at that intersection. I know that doesn't have anything to do with the fire truck. No, ma'am, but we're, we're certainly taking a look at that. Right. I, and, and I just wanted to say Merry Christmas. <laughs> you, you do realize I will never drive this truck, right? <laughs> they, won't, they won't let me. I'm the worst driver in the fire department. That's why I promote it. Thank you, Chief, and, and I think this is a cost-effective uh, event. Um, where are we going to park this? <laughs> it's going to be located at Fire Station 1 on North Street, which is our station closest to SFA. It's where the current ladder truck is, and it will fit. Oh, okay. Thank you. I actually had a question about whether it was going to fit or not. But, um, one other question I had, uh, just... This is more of curiosity than anything, but will the city be able to resell um, sort of as a salvage the, the older ladder truck? So, so our insurance adjuster has not uh, given us any kind of final determination yet, but I assume that we'll either have, well, we will either have some kind of an insurance settlement or we'll have some ability to resell that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. I do appreciate your creative finance, not as good as a forfeiture <laughs> that the police chief did, but, uh, <laughs> but you're, you're okay. Yeah, yeah, they won't let us take their houses when they catch on fire. Okay, do I have a motion? So moved. Ms. Bellinger? Second. Mr. Anderson? Any further discussion? Those in favor signal, I'm saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. You can skip back to the back. <laughs> the bill has finally passed. <laughs> Okay, presentation of proposed 2021-2022 budget and calculated property tax rates. Finance Director Pam Carbo. Mayor, Council, Pam Carbo, Director of Finance. Um, tonight, you're going to get to see your first viewing of the proposed budget that we kicked off on February the 8th. So almost six months later, we have a document for you. You have a copy in front of you. Um, we are actually going to kind of go through um, the high points of the major funds, but you do have all of our funds 
um, listed in the bound copy of the proposed budget. Um, to start off with, um, just a, a, a reminder that on property taxes, Senate Bill 2 was passed in 2019 that affected how municipalities set property tax rates. And so a couple of those items, um, we are now limited to a 3.5% increase um, annually. Prior to Senate Bill 2, it was an 8% increase annually. That was what was um, referred to in, in the olden days as the rollback rate, which brings me to the next um, item, the new terminology. Um, if you'll recall, in prior to Senate Bill 2, we had what was known as the effective tax rate and the rollback rate. Those now are called the no new revenue rate and the voter approval rate. Um, there is a little bit of a difference in the effective tax rate and the no new revenue rate. Um, prior to Senate Bill 2, um, the debt rate and the m and rate were used in the calculation of those effective tax rates. Now a no new revenue rate is truly no new revenue. It is the rate that generates the exact revenue from the prior year, both m and and debt. So in this case, um, we just um, agreed to purchase a fire truck with tax anticipation notes and that is going to increase the debt portion of our property tax rate. It does not affect, you'll see in a, in a few minutes, our no new revenue rate. Those, those rates truly only represent what we will be able to set a rate that brings in last year's revenue. So it will not cover the, the fire truck. The debt service portion of that is no longer included in, in the um, no new revenue tax rate calculation. Um, a new item that um, actually did not affect us last year because it was the first year of this, this year it does, it's called the increment rate. And so part of what um, the legislature did, of course they reduced the, the, um, the voter approval rate from an 8% increase to a 3.5% increase over um, your m and rate, but they also allowed us for three years to basically bank any unused portion of, of a property tax rate increase. So last year, uh, if you'll recall, we voted to approve the no new revenue rate. Okay, so we did not raise taxes last year. So what we have as an increment, increment rate is the difference between the actual rate that we adopted and last year's voter approval rate, which was about 1.7, 1.78 cents that we left basically left on the table last year. This new law allows us to take that um, increment that we did not you know, use last year and roll it to the next year. And we can actually do that for three years and then it just falls off successively after three years. So what this does is if we come in in a year and we have new programs or, or, or any, you know, anything that comes up that we need to fund, in the past, 8%, we were able to, to pretty much fund what we needed to with an 8% um, tax increase. Now, with a three and a half, you're very limited to what we can, we, we can um, garner from a tax increase. So now this gives us that ability on a short term to actually roll those unused rates for three years, and then they fall off. And so you don't get to bank it forever, um, but you will be able to increase your, your um, voter approval rate each year incrementally. And so this year, um, the part of the, the voter approval rate uh, calculation included that rate increment that we did not um, use last year. Um, I'm sorry, I'm using this because I have notes on it. So, <laughs> um, our assessed value, um, the appraisal district sent us our uh, certified estimates um, by the July 25th deadline. Um, our assessed value is at $1,871,060,361. This includes 17, a little over $17 million in new property that was added to the tax roll this year. Um, our prior year tax rate, so the current year that we're in, is 61.6 cents per $100 valuation. And then our calculated no new revenue rate for the 2021-21-22 um, fiscal year is 59.378 cents per $100 valuation and the voter approval tax rate is 63.777, which includes that incremental piece from last year. Our proposed tax rate, which tonight we're, we're just basically showing you what we're, what we're doing next 
Um, next council meeting, we'll actually ask you to vote on a proposed tax rate. But tonight, we're just kind of showing you what we've built our, our current budget on. And we're not in, in, uh, looking at a increasing the rate this year, staying at the 61.6 cent um, per $100 valuation, which gives us a little, uh, almost $10 million in o and m and 1.5 in debt. This does include the fire truck um, tax notes, okay? And so those were, those were already ca calculated and estimated in here. So that debt will cover our existing debt plus the, um, the fire truck. This also generates about $553,000 in new revenue for the city. Of that, $106,000 is from that $17 million of new construction, and the rest is from a certified value increase. So there were some reappraisal th this year, um, and so um, the, the additional amount of that um, increase is from those uh, value increases. So what does this look like for an average homeowner? So according to the appraisal district, when they run their averages, Nacogdoches, the average home value is 121800 before exemptions. And so what we do is we calculate that value with, with a standard homestead exemption at the proposed rate, which is 61.6 cents, and compare it to that same value at the no new revenue rate. And so you'll see here that the, under the proposed tax rate, that tax liability would be $627. Under the no new revenue rate, it would be $604, which is a $22, almost $23 increase in annual tax liability for the average homeowner. So here is just a, a high level overview of what you'll have in your actual budget document. Um, also, just um, for everyone at home, the, uh, the budget document is on the city's website currently, so anybody can download that at any point. Um, and where yes. is it exactly? To it's on the city's finance page finance. Mm -hmm, under budget. Mm -hmm. And um, we'll, every time, if we do any adopt, you know, uh, uh, updates during this process, they will be on, on the website. Um, so this budget that we're bringing to you tonight um, for general fund is about $27.2 million dollars and operational revenue. You'll notice here that that is split between property taxes and sales tax, which is our two, um, our two large tax items. Our franchise fees is about 9%. Um, Interfund transfers, 21%. And then other revenues, which includes fines, fees, user charges, those types of things are 7% of the general fund budget. So you will see that your general fund um, is heavily supported by, by property and sales tax, as general funds historically are. Um, for general fund expenditures by function, public safety is 60% of your uh, operational expenditures go to the public safety function. That is fire, police, uh, inspections, and animal services. General government, who would be finance, HR, city manager, um, those types of, of departments. Um, cultural and recreation, parks, recreation, um, historic sites, those types of departments. And then highways, which would be your public works and streets departments. When you look at general fund by classification, you will see that 79% of our operating expenditures are for personnel. So this is salary and benefits for, for all of the general fund um, department employees, which is, is the, the main um, piece of our um, expenditures in the general fund, followed by contractual services at 11%, um, supplies, materials at 3 structures, maintenance of structures at 4 um, and so, yeah, sundry charges, that is um, payments into the equipment replacement fund um, is at 2%. So, um, one more thing on the general fund before we jump over. I was going to ask you if you have any questions, but let me go ahead and, and pop on here real quick. Um, this year, we have, um, if you'll remember last year, we kind of put the skids on uh, a lot of budgeting of um, capital because we didn't know really what was going to happen with, with um, COVID. And so the whole budget process last year was a little bit different than in the past. And so um, we expected there to be um, additional requests this year for um, capital because we didn't fund a lot last year. 
Um, and so this does look a little bit high, $1.6 million in capital equipment improvements. But honestly, this is probably getting us back to probably a year, year and a year, two years before um, COVID. This was what a normal um, capital uh, project and capital um, equipment budget actually looked like prior to COVID. So this was, this was not um, anything that was unusually high um, for us this year. This, there is detail in your budget, but there are several um, software and server um, upgrades for IT and the police department, um, renovations of several public works facilities, the animal shelter, uh, flooring, um, the comprehensive plan, and then vehicle replacements across several uh, general fund departments. Um, I know inspections is in there, streets departments has several, and these are just vehicles that are on the annual replacement schedule. As well as capital improvement plans um, of $180,000 for the Ritchie Street Park Playground. This will be the first of, I think, five or six playgrounds over the next few years that we're going to try to fund one per year. Um, street rehab, of course, is $250,000 annually, and we've done that for quite a few years. And then various other community service projects, uh, like I said, they are all listed in your um, budget by, by detail. Before we jump over to utility fund, do y'all have any questions specific to the general fund um, that I could answer for you? I, I just have one question. On the assessed values, uh -huh. that one billion, is that broke, you have that broken down as to new business or new residential? The, the, the only thing that we have as far as new construction, the 17 million, mm. but I don't know. We do not receive a breakdown as to what that is. I, I can request that from the, the appraisal district, though. Um, I'm, I'm sure they have that in, in um, you know, some, you know, oh. whether it's residential, commercial, industrial, or whatever. No, I'm good. Yep. Uh, the inner fund transfer, is, is that normally 21% or in that general area? Yes. Does that change? Yes each year? Yes, every year it changes a little bit. This year we were able to, I know every year we talk about those interfund transfers, we were able to reduce the percentage that we are allocating of those budgets. We're trying to whittle them down over time. We were just not able to reduce them a whole lot this year. Um, but that is part of, and if you'll recall, in, in one of our, um, our tier one, tier two, and tier three items of things to address for future, that is, that is one of those things that we would like to address a, a, a more impactful reduction in those transfers over time. That is just going to take um, a significant amount of time to actually whittle that down. Um, but, but this year, this is, this, is, this is pretty much in line with where we've been the last several years. Thank you. Uh -huh. Any other questions before we jump to utility? I just want to <clears throat> make sure I understand that the we, we have increased our personnel costs by $700,000 just in the raises and in the, right? Is that correct? So, yes. Before we add any new personnel. That's well. I think that's what you said before. Um, for the compensation plan last year, yes. Okay, so yes, last year we had about $700,000, which, which, which was nine months of the new compensation plan. So a whole year of that has been budgeted plus a 1% COLA, Plus, we've increased um, our minimum wage from 1270 to 1333 in this budget, and then those positions that that we talked to the tier ones were also added. So we've done a lot on the on the personnel side in this proposed budget. Okay. And, and what's the total of the increased um, personnel cost? I, I, that's all right. Yeah, <laughs> I can okay. get you that though. Okay. I I just, I, you give me a round. No. Is, it, is that cola added in or before the cost? Of, uh, minimum wage well actually it will the way our system is set up we will actually increase all of our pay grades by one percent mm -hmm. after we adopt the budget and so actually the the minimum wage will be the 1333 plus whatever the one percent cola okay. is yeah okay. so you. it will go up a little bit not much and, and it will every year right and well year. well the the this year we've built in a one percent cola what we're hopeful is that we get the the employee evaluation system up and running this year, and so we'll we'll switch into a merit-based system. And so that was the whole point of us trying to get that 
compensation plan up and running so that we can transition to a merit-based system. And so what you should see next year instead of, and across the board, everybody gets a 1% or 2%, you're going to see those people that are actually performing at a higher level are eligible for those merit increases. And so those things, now, that does not preclude us from doing COLAs from time to time, but we are going to try to transition into a mostly merit-based pay system. That makes sense. Yes, and, and one of the reasons I ask these questions is because I, I would like to understand what we have to sustain in the future yes. years. Also, yes, yes, you know, yeah, and so that this budget, right? And so each year as we go through that process, we will, you know, going forward, we will look at a a budgeted amount for merits, and we have to work within that each department. Um, and then, like I said, you know, we are always um, we are always open to a, a cost of living adjustment as well if that's something that council wants to do. And, and you know that I have issues with merit versus cost of living. Because cost of living is everybody. Yes. Merit is pertaining to yes. a certain amount of people. Yes. Everybody needs a cost of living. Well, and, and we, we historically have done those not every year. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, I would say probably every two to three years we've had had a a cost of living um, adjustment, just depending on, on funding. And so, yeah, that's definitely something that every year can be looked at. Yeah. Um, it was part of, as, as, as we did the compensation plan, was getting everybody to minimum. We, we, can't, we don't want everybody to fall behind. And right. so that is one of those things that, that we will have to look at to make sure that we don't um, fall behind those minimums that we set when we, when we implemented the, the compensation plan. You good? Are you? I'm good. We'll, we'll ask you some more at the end. No, that's fine. Uh, let me just ask mm -hmm. one little question. Is that compensation plan available on the website, too? The the report that was done, the evaluation, the whatever? I, I have no idea, well, but anyway, I can find I out for you. Know. Yeah. I, I, that's it, okay. in, the, in, in the interim with, with the HR director position being open right now, that may be difficult for me to put my hand on tomorrow, but we can definitely do it within, within a few days. Okay. So jumping over to another large fund, which are, is our utility, which is our water and sewer fund. Um, this is pretty much um, water and sewer only in this department, and so this is directly from water and sewer bills um, issued. So you'll see that the majority of that revenue comes from there. That little miscellaneous piece um, is late payment penalties and, and the such, but the majority of that is actual user fees. So when we sell water, this is, is a good wonderful number and when we're not selling water this is kind of hard to to make budget and so um, although rain is great sometimes it, it it works against us on the budget side so uh oh yeah so we look at utility fund by classification um, you'll see that this is a whole different picture here than it was in the general fund general fund was very heavy on the personnel services um, that is because we have a significant portion of our employees in the general fund, fire and police being the two largest, um, over 150 employees between the two of those. Um, utility fund, not so much. Um, and so the personnel services here is just about a 20% piece of the pie. Um, contractual services, maintenance and supplies. The sundry charges here, those are debt service payments on existing um, bonds. And then the interfund transfers, of course, that we, we speak of normally, the operating in, in um, transfers, as well as the franchise fee transfers into the general fund. And this is all in line with where we've been the last few years. There was no significant um, changes with the utility fund, with the exception, I would say, of um, materials and supplies, which is a very small piece of the pie, but um, this is where um, chemicals are purchased. And there has been a, a significant increase in chemical cost over the years. And so I would say um, as far as the operational budget of the utility fund, that was the one area that we did have to see some increases um, in the budget um, for the increased cost of chemicals. But everything else is pretty much in line with where we've been the last several years. Um, for capital in the utility fund, um, this is absolutely almost identical to the amounts that that we proposed last year um, for capital equipment. 
right at a half million dollars, and these are all replacement vehicles in both the utility construction and the wastewater departments. Uh, one of those in the utility construction was a um, dump truck, and so that's why it's a little bit higher than the wastewater vehicles, um, but these are mostly crew vehicles that um, have met end of life. And then under capital improvements, um, this is your CIP. Like I said, it's detailed in the back of your, of your budget, but water system improvements of about $1.2 and wastewater system improvements of about $5.8 um, Any questions on utility fund before we jump over to sanitation? Okay. Sanitation fund. Um, this one is, is pretty much in line with where we have been. Uh, sanitation charges have been... Um, well, I did not mention, let me back up on utility real quick while I'm here. We, we do not have a rate increase for utility fund. This last year was the year five of five year phase in on rate increases. So there's no rate increase um, proposed for the utility fund this year, as well as sanitation fund. Now, during this next um, fiscal year cycle, we'll be looking at that. And so we'll be running those analytics to see if we're where we need to be on those rates because it's been five years since we've done a rate study. And so that's something we'll be working on, but that will not be, that will be until next fiscal year. So there's no rate increases proposed for, for either utility or sanitation fund at this time. Um, in the sanitation fund, your revenues, basically the sanitation charges, that is the amount that shows up on your um, utility bill. Um, the sanitation fuel charges, we, several years we split that out, and we base that on actual fuel cost. So if fuel is running $1.60, don't we wish, um, those fuel costs to the, to the uh, um, customer are reduced. Um, when it's $2.60, um, it's increased. And so those had our rates kind of um, abnormally inflated over the years when, when fuel was low. And so when we pulled that out, that allowed us to literally just recoup fuel costs directly, um, so there's no there's no um, way that that the citizens are paying for something that we're not actually having to cover the cost of fuel anymore. So that was pulled out, and then the landfill gate receipts. Um, that is just like it says, it's just people that actually drive into the landfill um, for extra garbage dumping and and such. For expenses by classification. In the sanitation fund, personnel services, sanitation fund, of course, is sanitation collection and disposal and now an administration department. And so there's not a significant portion of, of employees there either. So personnel services is 30%. Um, supplies, maintenance, there's very small pieces of, of um, the pie. Capital improvements, I could not get that little piece of pie to leave. It is 0%. I'm not sure how to make that little piece of pie go away, so sorry about that. Um, and then interfund transfers here are, are a significant portion of the sanitation fund. Again, this is franchise transfers as well as operating transfers. So a piece of that is the franchise um, payments that we make for running the sanitation um, system. On capital, um, we did have... Um, a couple of extra equipment items that were up for replacement this year. Normally, the last two or three years, we've tried to replace at least two garbage trucks per year, a front load and a rear load. Um, this year, we have not replaced a side load truck in, I want to say, five or ten years. It's been a while since we replaced a side load truck, so this year we have added that into the mix. Um, we also, now that we're running two brush trucks, one of them is in severe um, shape and needs a replacing, so we have requested that we replace um, that second brush truck. We have a D2 dozer at the landfill that needs to be replaced, and then, of course, several crew vehicles um, and software that will... Um, the software is a route optimization and a backup camera system for all of the bigger trucks. And so um, that makes up about $1.5 in capital equipment, and then capital improvements um, is a continuation of the current year landfill expansion um, at another $750,000 as we work through that process. Before I get to my closing remarks, is there any questions about any of, any of the, the budgets that we've talked about so far? I think nope. we'll probably talk to you more at the end. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so... What's included in this budget that, that was not included in a prior year budget? So we, thankfully, were, were able to proceed without a premium increase 
either on the city side or the dependent side for health and dental insurance. So we were proud of that and we're going to be able to maintain a very healthy fund balance um, in the self-insurance fund. So we were, we were excited about not having to do any increases there. We have included a 1% COLA for all employees. We have increased the city minimum wage from a pay grade 12, it was $12.70 an hour, to the 1333. This is prior to the 1% COLA being applied, so there will be a little bit of, of an adjustment there. Um, per the council direction at the last council meeting, we had some tier one items that we would like to go ahead in and add into this budget, those being a, an enhancement to the code enforcement, which re required us to hire a full-time um, position in sanitation for um, uh, illegal dumping and as well as two uh, part-time code enforcement officers, um, some customer service enhancements to hire um, clerical staff for HR and for um, historic sites for the Zion Hill um, streets department, utility and sanitation operators. Um, we added some laborers and some operators in those positions. Those were all new employees that were not, or programs that were not included in last year's budget. Um, as well as last, last uh, council meeting, we had talked about um, the possibility of at some point um, adding a community outreach and engagement, um, diversity, inclusion type department. At this point, this budget is not built with that in here. Um, that can always be addressed at any point that council decides to move forward with that. I think at this point, um, we're, we need to do a little more investigating as to how to even build that budget. We're not sure what that exactly is going to look like. And so at this point, this budget is not built with, with that department included. Um, yes, did you have? Yeah. I just wanted to address the council. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, Pam summarizing just items to note. Uh, you know, I know there's a lot of discussion still to be had over the next few weeks uh, with the budget. One of the things we'd like to get direction on, if we could today from council, is on code enforcement. Uh, those Sometimes those are difficult positions to hire. And so certainly we can wait until October uh, when the budget's adopted to start, try, uh, start the hiring process. But uh, if you all believe that code enforcement is a big priority for, for this community, we'd like to get started sooner rather than later. So that's one thing. And then the last piece is on the last bullet. Uh, Ms. Curbo mentioned that the community outreach person uh, and program is not included in the budget. You know, and as mentioned, there was direction from council to look at that program, evaluate it, uh, potentially uh, look at uh, creating some funds for it. And so, you know, just giving it some thought over the last couple of weeks and, and speaking with the mayor, you know, we're still in the process of the very early stages of this. We have not started really in earnest the, the research and analysis of what that means. Uh, you all uh, assign council members uh, Bolden and Fisher along with myself uh, and potentially Dr. Delaney Fields uh, from SFA and certainly community members to come together and, and talk about uh, um, how, what that means for our community, what that means for the organization to, to look at this program. So still very early stages and in just in discussions about this, just didn't think it was prudent to go ahead and put resources in a budget that we don't really have a full handle on. So I think certainly we can work through that process, uh, do the analysis, do the uh, research, uh, engage the community and find out what that means for Nacogdoches, uh, and then come back to you all with options and a recommendation, let you all re review it, discuss it, um, and, and then determine how you want to proceed with that, with that process. So again, as I mentioned, didn't think it was prudent to include it in the budget for something that we don't really know what it means yet, what it means yet until we do some more analysis. And so uh, I just want to apologize, Council. I wish I would have been a little bit more clear last week to make sure that there was no confusion as to do we add the funds, do we not add the funds. And so I, I apologize for that, for, for just jumping to conclusions of just adding the, the program in, into the budget. And then so with that, I'd like to back off that program for now until we we get further along into the process. So right. that's really all I had there. Can I, can I add further? one thing uh -huh. to that? Yeah. Um, as well, I, and the code enforcement is going to be a, a big issue, and we do we would like to get those those advertised so that we can fill them. Another position would be the the customer service, the clerical position in the HR department. Am I correct in saying that? Yes. Our HR department right now is is very thin, um, and we would we would like to go ahead. We will not, be, I'm sure, be able to fill it prior to October 1, but we would like to go ahead and, and get some direction if y'all are okay with us advertising that position 
um, we, we would like to get some help on um, the, the clerical side in the HR department right now, especially with open enrollment going. They're going to be spread really thin, so they're going to be behind, and so they're going to need some help sooner rather than later. So that would be an, another item of, of outside the code enforcement that we would like to look at, too. Okay. Uh, I would like to open for public comment now. Anything about the, about the budget, either of these? Council, your comments, Mr. Anderson. Um, I don't have any particular questions. I, um, I'm pleased that uh, we're proposing being able to stay at our our uh, new new revenue rate um, two years in a row, which is. We're, we're actually proposing staying at the, the current rate. The current which, rate. Which, yeah, the 61.6, okay, no, 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 right, 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 right. Yeah, right. thank you for clarifying mm -hmm. yeah, that. Yeah. Um, but, uh, no, I mean, I, at this point, uh, don't have any particular questions. The, you know, all the information you've given us has been very thorough, and I appreciate that. We've seen it two or three times. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's it. Ms. Ballinger? You're going to see it a lot more, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, uh, come back to me. I have several <laughs> questions and thoughts. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mayor. Community Outreach and Engagement Program. Mm -hmm. I don't want it to go away, mm -hmm. uh, and I don't want to push it so far down the line that we forget that it's been discussed. The, the one issue that I may have with it is that I don't see this as a full-time employee. Uh, we're going to have to... Uh, what we call a subject matter expert. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that person would come to Nacogdoches if it's someone outside of Nacogdoches. Right. If it's someone inside of Nacogdoches, I wouldn't see a problem as being part-time. Yeah. But uh, to be part-time subject matter expert, which this person we're looking for has to be that right. person. You know. But I don't see it as a full time. So you, when you're looking at the budget, think in relationship to being, if you, if it's viable, mm -hmm. to be a part time. Right, and I think that that's one thing that that Mario was saying. We we've got to do that that analysis. We've got to do that research because we really don't know what that looks like for Nacogdoches. Right. I know a lot of cities exactly. have done this. We haven't done it for us, and so that's one of those things that we'll have to determine. Do we need a full time? Do we need a part time? What what does it look like for Nacogdoches? And so yes, that will definitely be something that we'll we will be considering. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Your turn. Your last. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have several questions. Okay. First of all. Um, I would really uh, like to see the details, the, you know, the proposed budget in detail and um, the presentations in a specific site so that people can access this right now right. because we're going to be having uh, public hearings on this. I've gotten several questions and I can read off or I could copy or I could do whatever, right. but I, it really needs to be... that. That's part of our engagement and our sure, transparency sure. and our collaboration with our community. Uh, Mario has actually spoken to me about that, and so today was really trying to get this ready for y'all tonight. I actually have, um, I'm going to meet with my IT director tomorrow and try to work on a specific link on the city's webpage that we will be able to link all of the PowerPoints, the, the, the presentations that the departments gave y'all over the last several meetings. We'll put all of that on the web page web page but as we go forward every time that we come to y'all we will update those those that is going to be updated every time there's any any change whatsoever it will be updated on the web page and so y'all be advised of that as well um, that kind of brings up another point and and, and I want to I, I want to say it right now because I'm afraid I'll forget y'all understand this is this is very much a first draft but this will be the budget that is adopted without any feedback. And so if there's something here that y'all don't want or there's something not here that you do want, that is we're going to have over the next several meetings those, those opportunities for y'all to give me that feedback to make this budget what you 
what you want to to do and so we're, we'll have a couple of we'll have a workshop on the 17th and then we'll have a public hearing on the 7th um, so y'all y'all will still see this over and over so please if y'all have any items that you want to to give us direction on please let me know because we, we can work to incorporate whatever we need to um, into this before we get to the point of adoption so you will see this over and over <laughs> And I'm a strong believer in civic engagement, and I hope that um, the people who actually go on to the site and have questions also call us and ask us, right. in, you know, in detail right, what, right. What, what this is for and why, because sure. it's our budget. Yes, yes, most definitely. So that was my first question. My yeah. second question is, I know there's a, a long-term capital improvement program plan, mm -hmm. so... If we're going to the taxpayers and asking for, it's a 2.3 cent increase, mm -hmm. correct, in taxes, is what we're from, talking from about. From the no new revenue, right. which would be from the, the no yeah. So, that, so it's basically an increase I, I, in taxes of 2.3 Right, right, from the, from, the, from the no new revenue rate of 59.37 to the 61.6. Taxes right. versus, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. So if we ask for that and then we're going to come back and ask for capital improvements, how is that going to work? Are we okay? So the capital improvements are funded. About the larger capital improvements that we're oh we the big about? like a like a right. bond, bond program. Bond. Yeah, okay. that that will definitely be that that's not included in this budget. The the capital improvements program that's in this budget is the stuff that we will we will want to fund this year, and we kind of went over the highlights of those those tens and hundreds of millions of dollars worth of projects that we will have to look at, that will be something that will come up either in this next fiscal year or the next through a bond program. And so there's a whole process to go through that. But yes, those will all be um, um, by, you know, it, by bond. So they, they're not included in this. Um, and so that, that is at that, the point that y'all decide to go forward with the bond program is when you pick and choose which of those items you want to, to fund because it is most of the revenue items on the utility inside would be a revenue bond that would be covered with water and sewer rate structure. So there may be a rate increase needed to fund some of those bigger projects. On the general fund side, then it would be secured with property tax um, monies. Those bonds would, would affect your, your debt rate, yes, for future years. D did you want to? Well, I think I'll add to it too as well that the, you know, as, as Pam mentioned, the, the long-term CIP, I mean, that's a conversation that has not been held in public with the council. It's a workshop. It's going to take some time to go through those items in detail, to figure out what, to compare the priorities that staff sees as being immediate needs just based on what we do every day and what's seen every day versus what you all believe are priorities uh, for this community. Can't do it all at once. It's going to take some time, so we're going to have to have a workshop for that uh, based on the projections that we have. With the exception of the, of the fire truck, all debt's rolling off next fiscal year. Mm -hmm. right. So you're going to have capacity. Right. So we're going to have to have conversations with you all. You all are going to have to have conversations with the community, just like with us as well, as to what do we want to do to address our infrastructure. So there's going to be debt capacity if you choose to issue debt uh, on the tax rate for a bond program. Well, let me rephrase my question yeah. then. Um, will this current budget... Um, pretty much solve our water, sewer, uh, roads, infrastructure? No, no way. No. Okay. Because, <laughs> you know, just in this last month, you know, I've seen repairs, you know, and blowouts, and, wow. and there's huge problems with roads and, um, yeah. and sewage and the landfill. Will it solve the problems at the landfill right now with, with equipment at the landfill? Will this budget take care of with and equipment? The now we are buying we're buying right. some equipment at the landfill, okay. but as far as the right. improvements, yeah, no. Those those are those are big dollars long term long term um, fixes. So this what this we're is talking about right now is increasing taxes two point three cents and then uh, correct. I mean, I, 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 let me. Well, I mean, what know. you're talking about <laughs> is <laughs> what you're what I you're talking about is now. increasing tax rates for your operating of the city. Right. So you can right. the council can choose to not do any new programs, and we can we can you know I'm, we can. I'm just clarifying. No, well, I'm I'm, I'm clarifying too. But what you're adopt, what you're looking at considering is the operation operation and maintenance of the city. 
you have some debt service that has the servicing old debt, you all approve the, the purchase of a fire truck, it's going to service the debt for that fire truck for the next eight to nine years. Starting next year, or next fiscal year, a year from now, basically, you will have debt roll off. But this budget, nor any of the operating budgets, will not address the deferred maintenance that this community has not had for years. It's going to take a lot of money and a lot of conversations with the council and the community as to what everyone believes is a priorities for this city and how it's going to get funded. It's just not going to, it's not, it's not able to be funded with the existing budget that we have. It's just not possible. It's impossible. Right. It's, well, I'm just trying to clarify what yep. we've got right now. And another question I have is the ARPA funds are, that's $8 million, is that right? Yes. $4 million eight. now and then $4 million mm -hmm. later. So how are we going to use those? Well, we'll, we'll have, we, we, we are beginning the process of that. We, we filed all our paperwork to actually apply for that, and so we're set. Um, to receive the first 50 percent and so we are working through now the the voluminous regulations of what we can use that money on that again we have not gotten that money it's promised we haven't gotten it it's not included in this budget as that money comes in we will work through what we what we can propose legally to spend that on and we'll come back to you with with those um, as that money comes in and those will be budget amendments as we go um, there's some very strict regulations on how we can spend that money and we just want to make sure that we spend it correctly um, but yeah there's there's gonna be money for some infrastructure there um, eight million dollars does not go a whole long way with the with the infrastructure needs that we have but we will be able to do, do some with it yes um, I think that is most of my questions. I'm, I'm, as I said before, I'm concerned with the, the water and the sewer and the, you know, I, I'm making sure we don't have to boil water again and that we, and we haven't had to for a while, so I'm glad, and uh, that we have, you know, fire and, and police protection. Yeah, most definitely. Any other questions? I don't believe so. We'll move on to F, set well, public hearing dates. I, well, before we do that, oh, sorry. I was just going to show you real quick. Um, this oh, is kind of, to, yeah. I'm sorry, we got to talk about potentially moving ahead with that hiring. Right, or right. Or posting. Well, um, and, and, and also, I'd like to see if we could, I mean, if we could reduce that 2.3 cents. I would, I would, because it affects so many people, and, and so many people have been hit so hard. If we could do that, particularly, uh, I'm wondering about our ongoing personnel costs and adding. Just if we could just take a, another just look. Just tell at us what you want to cut. So well, those those I those new positions that those tier one positions that we added in. Right. Okay, so that that's what it took to get all that new stuff. Right. So as we go through that, if there are some of those positions that you want us to relook at, the code enforcement, the the customer service, the Zion Hill full time. Those, those streets operators, the sanitation operators, those are the ones that we have built into this that were not there prior. And so, yes, if that's something that you want to go back and say some of those tier ones we want to make tier two, yeah. just, we just need to be advised so that we can do that, and then we will, we will adjust those, those property tax rates accordingly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Will that uh, reduce our service to the citizens? It's definitely going to impact services because each of those new empl employees were added for, for each of, as those departments presented to y'all what their struggles are. And so, yes, I mean, I, at the end of the day, there, there's going to, we're going to still be in the same situation that we are today with, with not being able to provide all the services that we need to with, with the lack of staffing. So, yes, so there's, there's, it's a catch-22, honestly. So I think at our last council meeting we talked about the possibility of using some of the ARPA funds to um, decrease the, the what we would have to collect in taxes also. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, because some of those, like there's a generator and there's some, you know, capital equipment that I think. Uh, yes, others, now th those are all, those are, those are all budgeted out of reserves. And so we will schedule those during the year. If we find that some of those capital reserve items can be um, utilized with those, those um, federal monies, then yes, we can, we look at that. That does not affect our operational budget, which is tied to your property tax increase. And I do want to say I'm I'm ready for the code enforcement uh, officer. I, I think we actually have to add that position, so even now. Can pay him. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and post it. 
Yeah, so, I mean, is that consensus that we go ahead and post the code enforcement? Uh, yes. And then also the... HR department clerk position. So, so my question about the HR department, mm -hmm. if you hire an HR uh, director, um, would that, I mean, do we absolutely still need the other... The, cler the, the clerical person? position will be a whole different skill set than, than right. the director, of yeah. course. And then one of those, those job functions that we want to be able to utilize that HR clerical person for is our central city hall contact. Um, taking all those phone calls, the, the people that right now people are wandering around or they're calling the city manager to ask, where's the courthouse? Those are the kinds of calls that we are getting in various areas. We would like to be able to, to really enhance our customer service by saying, here's the main phone line and this person is responsible for directing everybody um, as well as assisting HR with, with their clerical needs that because they, they really are honestly are operating an entire department without a clerical person and have for a couple of years. So, um, yeah. yeah. So. so, consensus on that as well to move forward with the posting. Do we need to make a motion on no, I don't think we need a motion on either of those. Just, yeah, we just, just need just, if you're okay with it, that way it gives us the opportunity to at least get the job descriptions done, yeah. positions posted. It's going to take time. I mean, yeah. we probably won't hire anybody until October 1st anyway, anyway but that's so just. Certainly get moving on the code enforcement. We've got to yeah. do better there. Okay. Absolutely. In, in regards to lowering the tax rate, what's, I mean, it was brought up, so, I, because again, we're going to be coming back to you the next council meeting with this budget document or something different. So I, we need to know what's the flavor of council on that. What, what is it that we're not going to fund or not do to, to chip away at the rate? I, I don't see it. I mean, I, I, think, I think we're pretty, pretty bare bones on what we've got here. I think we, we need those, those positions that we've talked about. Yeah, so, absolutely. I mean, certainly I'd welcome a dialogue maybe between you and uh, Ms. Bellinger if, if she, she had some ideas, but I, I, I don't know where it is. I, I do have some thoughts, but I'm not going to, I mean, I just saw the, this part today, so I, I'd like to spend sure. some time, yeah. and I would like to. And we'll, we'll have a, a budget items. workshop on, on the 17th, and so we can still address any of those issues there. It is getting towards, you know, I know he's thinking, oh, Pam's going to be so stressed out, but it is getting towards the end, but we still can make some changes even after the 17th workshop. And, so. and also I'd like to see it, you know, public, you know, the, the, the um, what you gave us, the mm -hmm. specific details. Mm -hmm so that I can receive feedback. Right. You know, I think that's civic engagement. Right. So that brings up our, our plan for the next couple of months. Um, on the 17th, we will have another workshop. Um, and then that night is when we will need to vote on the proposed tax rate. Now keep in mind that what we're going to propose, at this point we're proposing a 61.6 .6 cent tax rate. Um, you can, by the time we actually adopt the tax rate in September, you can go lower than whatever y'all vote on the proposed tax rate on the 17th. You just can't go above it. So um, what we'll bring to you on the 17th is the 61.6. Y'all will vote on the proposed rate. You're not voting to adopt the rate that night. This is a new portion of the Senate Bill 2, so there's a whole new set of rules. Um, we'll come back on the 7th and have a public hearing on the budget. Um, you do have to take action on the budget that night. You do not have to adopt the budget. You just have to say, we'll adopt it next week but you have to take some action. Um, another um, new caveat to the, to the law is now there can only be seven days between the public hearing on the budget and the public hearing on the tax rate. Um, there has to be seven days, there has to be time between them. You couldn't do the, budget, the public hearing on the budget and the tax rate on the same night. You have to have the, the public hearing on the budget has to be prior to the tax rate but can't be longer than seven days. So we will have a special call meeting on the 14th to adopt the budget if we need to, and then have the public hearing on the tax rate and adopt the tax rate on that night. So that's kind of what we're looking forward to for the next couple of months. Like I said, you're gonna see this several times. Um, so yeah, this August the 17th, I'm not gonna tell you the drop dead date of making changes, but it's, it's pretty much where we need to know where we're going um, so that on the 7th, um, when we have that public hearing on the budget, that the citizens are actually looking at the budget that you are hoping to adopt either that night or the next. Okay? You need action on F? No. No. Okay. No. 
All right, if there's nothing further, then we're oh. adjourned. Oh, oh no, no, nope. it's F. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought that was, I thought F was this. I'm sorry, no, we have, we do have one more item. The, the last item is to set the public hearing dates. Oh, I'm okay. No, I I'm sorry, I didn't. Were, I thought that's what you were Well, you, you said F, and I thought F was this <laughs> one, sorry. so okay. I'm sorry. Um, yes, part of the new law is you actually have to set the public hearing dates tonight. And so, um, actually, that's on a whole different While you're looking, I, I do uh, really want to thank you for all this work that you've done on this. Thank and you. I also, I, I can't say enough how uh, impressed I am how you keep us safe with our federal dollars. Well, we, we, yeah. we definitely do not do not prefer to be in a federal penitentiary. I would not do well there, so <laughs> I like my freedom, so we're going to make sure we spend it correctly. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, yes, tonight we do need to set and, and by action of the council set the public hearing for the budget for September the 7th and the public hearing for the tax rate at September the 14th. Okay, uh, set public hearing dates for both budget and tax rate. It's proposed there on the last page and I assume on the screen. Uh, do I have a motion? So, so okay. moved. Second. Mr. Anderson. Any discussion about those dates? Okay. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Okay, I won't rush you. Are you done? I'm done. <laughs> All right. Then I'd, we're adjourned.